Okay, so hi guys, welcome to the finals crash course series. Today we will be covering endocrinology part two. So in the top right hand corner is a QR code for our Instagram page. So if you're not following already, please do scan and follow. And in the bottom left corner is the email for us. So if you have any questions or anything like that, please do feel free to email us and we'll get back to you. So tonight's session will be taught by myself. So I'm Ashwini. I'm currently an F2 in London. Um, okay, so just going on to the next slide. So this is a QR code for our polls and I'll post the link in the chat as well. If you want to join. And the, the voting is completely anonymous, so please do give it a go. First bit is on diabetes. So these slides are originally made by Dr. Emily, um, who's kindly let me use an adapter slide. So just adjusted them a little bit um, according to more recent guidelines and a few little add-ons as well. So just going on to the first case. So got a 56 year old overweight man who comes into the GP complaining of urinating large quantities of clear urine and feeling tired. So if you want to type in the chat, um, you can also anonymously type on the VBOX as well on the voting thing and um, what your differentials would be. I know I mentioned diabetes, but do try and think of other differentials um, for this. I'll give you about a minute or so. Yep, so I can see someone's type uh, diabetes insipidus. Can you think of anything else? Yep, diabetes mellitus. Think of one more thing and then we'll move on. OK, I'm going to move on. So these are the different types of differentials for polyuria. So polyuria is basically passing abnormally large amounts of urine and it's usually clear. Um, this isn't to be confused with things like urinary frequency and polydipsia. So urinary frequency is when you're frequently um, voiding your bladder, but the volume can either be reduced or it could be just a normal amount as well and you and this is where you need to start differentiating between lower um, urinary tract symptoms and for things like UTI and this is where history really kind of comes into play and then polydipsia is increased thirst and that can actually lead to increased frequency as well but volume again may not be affected so other things to think about here um, is like diuretics, for example, heart failure. Um, so these things can lead to things like nocturnal polyuria as well, because you just end up with a lot of fluid buildup. And obviously with diuretics, you're, it's forcing the fluid out of you. Um, things like use of steroids and Cushing's can cause your diabetes um, symptoms because you're increasing the glucose in your blood. And this is why there's one of the reasons why we check um, your glucose levels when you're using steroids. <clears throat> um, other things like CKD that can also um, lead to things like hypercalcemia as well. This kind of introduces your nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Um, and that because you've got less um, effect of the ADH um, there. And then you've got hypokalemia. Um, so this then also can lead to um, reduced concentration of urine in the loop of Henle and that these things like um, increased urination and can also cause things. Um, other causes of this is also diarrhea, diarrhea, diuretics, for example, deep being in DKA and excess alcohol use as well. 
Okay. Next slide. So I've just put in a little table here for revision purposes, just going through the different causes of diabetes and other risk factors as well in the last column. Okay. So things to look for in the history to differentiate between if it is diabetes or another cause. Um, like I mentioned, looking for urinary tract symptoms um, versus your polydipsia and nocturia. Looking at um, their water and caffeine consumption um, and um, look, looking at other symptoms such as weight loss, fatigue, and if they're getting any recurrent infections. So with things like um, diabetes, you're more prone to getting things like UTIs. And um, so this is where it kind of blurs the line. So you need to try and figure out what's which kind of came first, essentially. And then you also want to do a systems review as well. Um, so, um, to check for things like bone pain, for example, because that's a sign of potential hypercalcemia. And I'll kind of go into a bit more detail on that later on in the session. Um, then we're looking at things like your their past medical history as well. So chronic renal failure, any cancers, especially endocrine cancers, and more specific to females, your polycystic ovarian syndromes, your gestational diabetes also increases the risk of getting type 2 diabetes. And then in terms of medication, check if they're not on any kind of steroids, any other over-the-counter medications which can um, affect their control of bl their blood sugar, diuretics, and also lithium um, can cause nephrogenic diabetes and septus. So think about your psych patients as well. And then with family history, that's a key thing here. So if both your parents have type 2 diabetes, about 75% of those offspring tend to develop it later on in life as well. So just continuing on with our case. So this patient's got polydipsia, polyuria, unexplained weight loss, recurrent infections and tiredness. So um, just think about the tests that you want to do and just type it in the chat. Again, I'll give it about a minute or so. Yeah, glucose levels, anything else? Yeah, HbA1c. Uh, you can think of, yep, your oral glucose tolerance test. All right, you move on. So we've got all of those. Um, other things you want to think about as well is checking their use and ease, checking their renal function, so their e EGFR as well. Um, thyroid function is another one that you would want to check as well as your serum calcium to just check if any of those things are affecting um, the patient leading to these symptoms. Um, the main ones for diabetes would be your blood glucose levels, typically your fasting, and then also your HbA1c. So, got our first SBA here. So you've got your 56-year-old man um, with the polydipsia, polyuria, uh, unexplained weight loss, recurrent infections and tiredness. So his HbA1c is 59. So what would you recommend for this patient? So I'm just going to open the polls now. Remember, this is completely anonymous, so please do give it a go. So you can see when people have answered D and that is the correct answer. So yeah, so for this guy, because it's over 48, um, so that's your kind of diagnostic criteria. Um, the other one would be if their fasting glucose is over seven and they're symptomatic, then that's another diagnostic criteria as well. 
Um, so you'd want to put them on some sort of medication and you'd also give them lifestyle advice, so dietary advice, exercise, things like that. Um, so with self-monitoring kits, for type 2 you don't normally give it um, unless they're on insulin or if they've got any evidence of any hyperglycemic episodes. So any um, medications, that, so tablets essentially, that would cause hyperglycemia, um, then you could give them self-monitoring at home, but otherwise you don't really need to keep monitoring it regularly. And then just as a note, I have put the nice guidelines in the notes bit, so when you get the slides later you can have a look at through those. So we mentioned the three key tests that we use for diagnosis. So if you suspect type 2 diabetes, you'll check their HbA1c if it's over 48 or check their fasting glucose, especially in children, gestational diabetes. So that's where you use the oral glucose tolerance test. So that's very much kind of isolated for um, pregnant ladies mostly and anyone with any kind of haemoglobinopathies as well, you'd want to do the fasting glucose. Now, if these kind of meet the diagnostic criteria and they're symptomatic, that gives you your diagnosis. If they're not symptomatic, then you want to repeat these tests at a later date. And if it's abnormal, then you've got your diagnosis. If it's normal, then you'd want to keep monitoring them because they're still at risk. So I think I put this here. Yes, I have. So with the HbA1c, for example, they can be in a pre-diabetes kind of state where they're between like 42 and 47. So in this case, you wouldn't start them on medication, but you would want to keep monitoring them because they're still they're at risk of being properly diagnosed with diabetes because their HbA1c can increase if they're not capable, uh, careful. So here, this is where you kind of really push that lifestyle advice and try, them, try to get them to control their diet, like reduce their carb intake, reduce their sugar intake, for example, and also try and encourage them to do a bit more exercise, be a bit more active. Um, and this is just a little table as well, which you can look through later on. Okay, second SVA. So the blood results come back for this patient patient has a history of CKD with a current EGFR of 28. So which of these drugs could you offer? So I'll open the poll. Okay, so you can see you've put S and that's the correct answer. So you'd want to give them one of these three, so your DPP4, your poglitazone or your salpinurias. You would avoid metformin um, because it's contraindicated if the EGFR is less than 30. So with the other three, so DPP4 and your polyglitazones, they fecally excreted their metabolites, so it won't get accumulated by the kidneys. Salfonurias, it's metabolized in the liver, but the metabolite is actually inactive. Um, so you won't it it won't actually affect the patient itself. Whereas metformin, it stays active and if it starts accumulating then that can cause issues such as lactic acidosis. And again, here's a nice little table, um, just kind of going through the different drug types, examples of common names, the mechanism of how they work, side effects, contraindications, and their monitoring. And this is mainly for your erosion purposes, which is why I put them in there. So you can have a look at that in your own time. So question three. You've got a 17-year-old man who presents to ED with vomiting, abdominal pain and lethargy. You suspect DKA. 
Which of the following results would confirm your diagnosis? So opening the poll. Okay, so you can see you put B, so B is the correct answer, but so is D, so B would be actually the correct answer here. So with DKA, you have your acidemia, so on the VBG, your pH would be less than 7.3. The other thing you would look for is the bicarb, so if it's less than 15, that's another indicator as well. So your normal bicarb is around 22 to 28, and normal pH would be around 3.3 uh, 7.35 to 7.45. Um, when they're in a ketoacidotic state, it dissociates and then you get the low bicarb as well as low pH at the same time. Um, the other things you'd look for is your high blood glucose and also positive ketones. Okay. So that's just a little summary of what I've just said here. So in terms of management, always approach everything with an ATE approach. Um, you would want a strict fluid balance for the patient. So this could be with or without, the cath without a catheter, but usually catheterization is um, ideal just because it's so much easier to monitor their urine output. Um, you would want to check their capillary glucose and ketones on an hourly basis. Um, check their ROBS. So red flags here would be if their O2 sats are less than 92 on air, if their systolic BP's under 90, and if their pulse is over 100 or under 60. Like other red flags would be if their GCS is under 15 or if they have an abnormal AVPU, depending on what you're using. And again, checking their VBG as well for their anion gap. So if the anion gap is over 16, um, look at their potassium as well at the same time. Um, and those are, the, and then um, also check their lab ketones too. So of course we're doing their urine tip, dip and also the bedside ketone test. So which is very similar to when they're doing their capillary um, glucose, but it's always, always important to send off the lab ketones as well. Other things you want to do is do ECG and consider putting them on a cardiac monitor because you can get um, ECG changes such as tall um, peak T waves or prolonged QT, widened QRS is because of the hyperkalemia or hypocalcemia. Um, you'd also want to do a chest x-ray, do a urine dip with an, and send off an MSU as well, looking for any kind of infected ca causes that have um, led to the DKA as well. And then other things like their lab E's and E's to check for their formal potassium as well before you start um, considering um, replacement for potassium. And then, of course, um, for certain patients, depending on how bad their DK is, you'd also want to consider if they need any kind of HDU or ICU um, admission. So. This, these guidelines are from the Grey Book, um, which is specific to George's, um, but I would check more local guidelines and check the NICE guidelines as well, but most of them overlap. So the key bits here to remember are that you want to give them fluid resuscitation. So you start off with a fluid bolus and then you start them on a fluid infusion. You do all your investigations, which you just went through. And then you'd also give, put them on a fixed rate insulin infusion as well. So this is your 50 units of Actorapid in your 50 mils um, of saline. And the starting rate would be six units per hour. And you'll continue that until the BMs are less than 14. Once it gets to 14, then you'd reduce the rate to three and you'd continue um, giving them an infusion of glucose instead so they don't end up going hypo 
and if they're on any long acting insulins as well in the background you'd always ensure that you give them so you stop the short acting but continue the long acting is what you need to remember because that's what's maintaining kind of the basal rate then the other thing that i mentioned was the potassium so in dka what will happen is the potassium will increase as you're giving the insulin this all shifts into the cells um so their potassium will decrease and if it's below 3.5 and it's persistently below 3.5 then you would consider replacement um sometimes it will come back on up on its own this is why it's really important to keep monitoring it and not just replace the potassium because you can end up um putting them into a hyperkalemic state Okay, question four. You bleep to a lady who's very drowsy. She is in hospital post hysterectomy. She's hypoglycemic. What is the first step in the management? Let's open the poll. Okay, he's talking the poll. So, in this case, um, the answer is actually B. So, just remember that the patient here is drowsy, so they're not going to be able to um, have anything that's oral. So, A, C, and E are out of the question here. According to the guidelines, it, um, you would give them high end glucagon. So this is just a quick um, summary of what to do. So hypoglycemia is when their BMs are below four. So in this case, the patient has reduced consciousness. Other um, reasons would be if, they have, if they've had a seizure or if they're nil by mouth, um, you would stop any insulin they're on. Um, do your ABC, um, give them your IM glucagon, the, um, but you wouldn't do that if they've got any kind of hepatic impairment or if they've got eating disorders. In those cases, then you would consider your 10% dextrose and you can give that up to uh, three times. Um, and then after 15 minutes, if the levels are above four, then you can give them something to eat. So like biscuits or a slice of bread, um, but you need to give them um, more like carb things than sugar, sugary things. And then you need to continue monitoring their BMs for about 24 to 48 hours. So in the case of someone who's conscious, orientated and able to swallow, this is where you can give them some fusipin juice or glucose tablets or glucogel. Um, and then same sort of thing is just recheck their BMs, offer them food and just monitor for about 24 to 48 hours. Um, and the other thing that you need to remember to do is also investigate why they became hypoglycemic. In this case, it's probably just a post-op thing, but sometimes you can also have other reasons why they might have recurrent hypoglycemia, like things like entelinomas. Okay, so HHS is very similar to um, DKA, but has a longer history. So usually about a week where they're very dehydrated, they've got very high glucose, usually over 30. The difference is their pH is stable and they don't have in they rarely have any ketones, usually none, um, or like trace. Um, the key thing to do is rehydrate slowly and just make sure there's no other illnesses in the background, which is leading to this um uh, episode. And then again, here's a little table for you to just compare the different ones. So again, very similar to your DKA guidelines, or you do all your investigations, check out what's going on. Um, then you'd give them a bolus of fluids and then give them a fluid infusion. Again, put them on a fixed rate um, insulin infusion as well. Same sort of guidelines. Um, then once it's at 14, reduce the fixed rate. Um, and then again, if they're on insulin, just continue the long acting, stop the short acting. 
OK. So next bit is on parathyroid disorders. So I've got first SVA here, this. I'm just going to open the poll. So what's the most common cause of primary hyperthyroidism? Stopping the poll now. So, correct answer is A. Well done. So, solitary adenomas and they're the most common cause. Other things are hyperplasia and your carcinomas. And then you've got your decrease of it D and your chronic renal failure, which is more your secondary. So, your hyperparathyroidism is your excess secretion of PTH. So your parathyroid, so there's four of these which are behind your thyroid gland and they normally secrete um, PTH in response to low um, calcium. So the action of PTH is increasing osteoclast activity which releases your calcium and the phosphates from the bone. The increased calcium um, uh, stimulates decreased phosphate reabsorption from the kidneys. And the reason this happens is because phosphate actually binds the calcium to reduce it in the blood. And the key bit here is you want to increase the level of calcium. It also in turn increases your D3 production, so vitamin D3 production. And overall, this leads to maintaining a high level of calcium and um, circulating. OK. So that's your primary causes there. Um, let's just just list it at the top. So in terms of presentations, um, sometimes it's just an incidental finding on routine bloods that they have high calcium. Sometimes they come in with symptoms, so weakness, tiredness, and um, they're depressed, like thirsty. So the things the kind of mnemonic to remember is your bones, stones, abdominal groans, and psychic moans. So all the bone pain that they might get. Um, they might end up with fragility fractures, for example, because their bones are thinning out. Um, stones, so they're more prone to renal calculi thrown, so your polyuria, your constipation, that kind of adds in with the abdominal groans bit. So abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and they can also end up with pancreatitis because you get deposits of the calcium in the ducts, and it also activates some of the enzymes. And then your psychic moans, so mood disturbances, depressions and fatigue because it um, affects your dopamine, serotonin and glutamate um, neuronal functions. Then you've got your secondary causes, so just generally having low calcium um, that leads to appropriate um, high PTH and that's usually due to low bit D, especially if you're living in this country. Um, you don't get much sunlight so you don't have enough vitamin D so this is where supplements are quite useful um, and, and then chronic renal failure as well and then tertiary um, you get high calcium levels and very high PTH um, usually after this is usually after like prolonged secondary hyperparathyroidism where the glands just go undergo change and just act autonomously and don't um, they don't kind of respond to the feedback loop and this is usually seen in CKD patients. Uh, key investigations to do here, so you measure the PTH um, and if the adjusted calcium, so this is the albumin adjusted calcium, is above 2.6 on two occasions or above 2.5 on two occasions and you suspect there is a primary hyperparathyroid, then um, <clears throat> that will kind of give you a diagnosis. And the other thing you want to do is a technetium 99 sestambini um, ultrasound of the neck. So this is where if there's any sort of masses um, in the parathyroid glands, then this will be taken up and then highlighted in the ultrasound. And that's your little mnemonic. I just kind of put that in there just because I like visual aids. OK, so. I think this is the last SBA actually. So just open the poll. So which syndrome or syndromes are associated with primary hyperparathyroidism? Okay, 
going to stop the poll now. So the answer is actually A, so your MEN1 and 2 syndromes. So if you go back to endocrinology part one, one of the lectures I did a few months ago, um, I kind of went into a bit more detail about these. Um, so just going over this, so your MEN basically means multiple endocrine neoplasias. So in MEN1, it causes the mutation in to the MEN1 tumor suppressor gene, and this is characterized your, by your pi primary hyperparathyroidism. You get your pituitary adenomas and your pancreatic tumors. In MEN2, there's two types. So this is mutations in the RET um, proto-oncogene, and it's characterized by primary hyperthyroidism, and this is mainly your MEN2A. Um, in men to b you can also get this, but it's rarer. Um, other things you want to kind of think about as well is your medullary thyroid cancers and your pheochromocytomas as well. And just very quickly going over hypoparathyroidism. So primary causes usually glandular failures and you get your symptoms of um, hypocalcemia. Um, Secondary radiation um, due to things like surgery, I'm sorry, radiation therapy and surgery for th um, like your thyroidectomy or parathyroidectomy. Um, hypermagnesium, um, so magnesium is needed for the secretion of PTH. And just quickly, symptoms um, are usually like muscle cramps, pain, and twitching muscles. And management is just replacement, so calcium carbonate and vitamin D supplements quite simple to treat this one. Well, oh, so that's the end. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. And this is the QR code here for the feedback form, and I'll just quickly post it in the chat too. Please do fill in the feedback form. And um, if you're watching on YouTube, we leave the feedback form open for quite a long time. So please do fill it in as well, because any feedback is very useful for us to keep improving. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening.